to our special colloquium yeah. um, today. It is slightly unusual time, but it's my great pleasure and honor uh, to welcome Arno Ausenbeutel, who visited us for, for today from, um, from Berlin. And I think many of you know Arno from like, many of the pioneering experiments he has been doing like over the years and inspired a lot of um, our work. And let me just say a few words. So before he did all that, Arno actually studied um, physics at several universities, as I just found out, at Düsseldorf, <laughs> in London, at the Imperial College, and at the University of Bonn. So that, already you don't see it that often. And then right after he again moved place, and he went to Paris to um, pursue his um, PhD with uh, the group of Sergei Roche, where he actually worked on some of the experiments that later were awarded with the Nobel Prize to, to search and use this whole label. And so, and since then, basically, Arno had, and between 2005 and 2017, he, he was holding several professorships, like back in Mainz, the University of Bonn, and then in the end at the, um, at the Technical University in, in Vienna. And since 2018, he is now at the Humboldt University in Berlin, where, where he is still now, and holding a chair for optics and and proponents. And so there is a list that I'm not going to do here of national and international awards that Arno um, has been receiving for, for his research and his results. So I think, like most recently, it's the Humboldt um, Professorship, which is kind of the most prestigious um, award for international sciences that we have in the world. And so I'm, I'm really I'm looking forward to hear what you, um, about your latest results that you. Um, yeah, to hear about the latest results, and, and as I said, so I, it's fair to say like that Arnold is a true um, pioneer in our field, so he has been like setting um, the stage for this field of um, nano um, fiber optics and nano fiber um, quantum optics. So I think even back in mind, he had this brilliant idea to pursue this idea of sort of pulling fibers like to these extreme scales where they become on the, like the thickness of just a few nanometers or thinner than our hair. I think. And, and since then, so he has been doing like a lot of inspiring experiments that led to many ideas, like for fundamental science, but also um, for applications. And I think still, they continue to amaze us. And I think we are going to do this now in the course. So I'm really looking forward to your work. Thank you, Thomas, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, it's uh, it will be a a dense day, and um, uh, I already learned a lot of interesting things and saw interesting things. I'm looking forward to seeing more of you and your work. And I'm very happy to show you some of ours um, this morning. So the, the title of the talk is, is pretty generic, um, but it has in it what, what we are uh, essentially working with or have been working with for more than a decade now, which is waveguide coupled atoms. And um, <coughs> since I will be talking about uh, several experiments, I just put how a simple quantum optical system can amaze you. And simple it is, as Thomas said, because it's just a waveguide with atoms uh, coupled to it. And um, I, I say amaze you because I tend to be amazed. I hope that you won't be bored. Um, and I would also like to start with a disclaimer. So some of the uh, things I will be presenting, I have never talked about, I mean, have never given a talk about. Uh, so if, if you feel like I'm not explaining it well, just ask questions. I'm very happy to, to stop and spend more time on things, and I don't have to get through all the, the slides. I think this could be a good setting also for just uh, having an interactive seminar, okay? I'm happy, would be happy uh, about questions during the talk. Um, one thing that unites the uh, experiments I will be talking about is that it's about collective interaction of emitters with a single field mode. And um, to introduce this topic, let us just imagine that we are looking at the emission of radiation by two emitters which are separated by much less than the optical wavelength. In that case, uh, we can actually say that these two emitters 
um, interact with the same electromagnetic mode, which in the Hamiltonian is just written here head wavingly with one um, annihilation and creation operator, and uh, the, the two <coughs> atoms here uh, coupled to this, this mode. And we, in the, in the Hamiltonian, we don't assume any atom atom interaction. And then when you look at the uh, single excitation regime, so either one of the two atoms being excited and no photon being present, or if both atoms in the ground state and a photon being present, um, then the, the basis uh, states that, that we find are actually a superposition of E and G where we either have a plus or a minus sign on depending on whether there is a plus or a minus sign here, we refer to these states as being super radiant or sub radiant. And the reason is that if we look at the transition rate, so of the rate of d decay rate of this excited atomic state, uh, then for this uh, super radiant state with the plus sign here, the uh, coupling is twice as large, so the decay rate is twice as large. Uh, whereas the subradiant uh, state here uh, has actually a zero matrix element with the uh, atoms having decayed and one photon being present, so uh, it, it does not decay. And um, usually one refers to the superradiant state also as the Dicke state, and uh, we can generalize what I explained here to n atoms by just writing uh, sum over uh, all possible states of one atom being excited. And the only difference then if we deal with n atoms is that this uh, transition rate here, n uh, is then, sorry, this transition rate is, is n times as large. And we have now n minus 1 subradiant states, but all of them in principle uh, do, do not decay. But here, of course, there are two things which in the experiment are, are not so uh, readily realized. One is that the uh, emitters are very closely uh, spaced and the other one is that there is no atom inter interaction even though the emitters are so closely spaced and the typical ex situation in experiments is that the distance is larger than the wavelength. And uh, then we can have states or excitations of these n atoms with a single excitation uh, where if the atoms are excited with uh, propagating light with a wave vector k, then we still have a Dicke state which looks exactly the same as before, so one atom being excited. However, um, now we have a phase vector here which corresponds to the propagation phase of the light from uh, to the position of the nth uh, or kth atom here or jth atom uh, here, so we have this e to the i car I K R J and and this state still exhibits a super radiant rate, decay rate. However, the enhanced spontaneous emission will now be directed because we have uh, here imprinted this uh, propagation phase. So our ensemble of atoms will predominantly decay. For example, if it's excited from the left with a propagating photon, it will emit to to the right. Okay. And um, what we now do is explore such collective effects in a close to perfect one-dimensional setting where we define this propagating mode using a waveguide uh, which couples to the atoms. And there's related works uh, by Charles Adams, Antoine Brovis, and Hidetoshi Kartori, so check out their, their work on, on such phenomena. And finally, I would like to say that in the introduction now, I was only talking about this uh, single <laughs> excitation regime here. Uh, the situation uh, can, of course, be generalized to more than one excitation being present. Um, but it turns out that then the, also the dynamics, to, even on the theoretical level, becomes harder to describe and to uh, understand. And we will also explore this multi-excitation regime. So, um, the outline is that we will talk about the collective radiative uh, dynamics of such waveguide coupled atoms. And what, one, one thing that we saw and we could actually uh, see experimental evidence of is that uh, in this time Dicke states, there is a coherent coupling between the sub and superradiant states. So, such a subradiant state will not stay subradiant uh, 
forever, but it's just a momentarily subradiant state, and uh, also the superradiant state will actually evolve into subradiant states. Um, then we will go from here, these two uh, are in the single excitation regime. We will then go to the situation where we have more than one excitation and even close to almost inverted ensembles of atoms coupled to the waveguide. And if I have time, I will also uh, then talk about the uh, transport of light through this ensemble and how it modifies the uh, photon statistics of the light that propagates through the ensemble. So let's start with uh, a collective radiative dynamics, but before doing so, I would like to thank the people who really did the work. So first and foremost, I have two senior co-workers, Philipp Schneeweiss and Jürgen Volz, who uh, supervise the sub-project on a daily basis. And then the experiments were done by a postdoc and PhD student initially, which is Ashlyn Johnson and Martin Blaha. Ashlyn is now with, Martin, with Markus Aspelmeier, and now the experiments gradually were taken over by the post of Ricardo Pinetta and the PhD student Daniel Lechner. So I very schematically sketch our experimental setup. As Thomas said, we are uh, working with ultra-thin glass fibers. They are made by heating and stretching an optical fiber until the waist of this tapered optical fiber uh, is thinner than the wavelength of the guided light, in our case here 400 nanometers. And if you now launch light into the fiber and you squeeze it into this very thin wire here, then uh, there's an evanescent field surrounding this nanofiber. And if we now prepare in the first experiment simply a cloud of laser-cooled cesium around the waist of the nanofiber, uh, then this light couples to the atoms. And what we then do is we launch resonant light, with, uh, which is resonant with a D2-line transition of cesium, uh, which is pulsed, so we actually use an electro-optic modulator to make pulses of, say, 150 nanosecond length. And then we analyze the light transmitted, this pulse, the transmission of this pulse through the ensemble, and we analyze the, uh, we can also analyze the back reflection of the light and detect in both cases with single photon counting modules. Um, the pulse rise and fall time here is much shorter than the lifetime of the atom, while the pulse length here is um, much longer than uh, the lifetime of the atom, such that we should see both transient dynamics after the switch on and switch off of the pulse, um, and we should have a kind of steady state of the atoms at the end of the pulse before <coughs> switching uh, off. Okay? So um, how do we now model the transmission of light through such an ensemble of fiber coupled uh, atoms. Uh, for this, we assume so-called chiral coupling, meaning that the light that propagates through the waveguide from left to right can be absorbed by the atoms, but then the atoms only emit into the, the direction of propagation of the light, and there is no back reflection of the light. I won't go into the details, but indeed this is something that can be realized thanks to special polarization properties of the guided modes of nanofibers. But it turns out that even if you, if you start by assuming the chiral <coughs> coupling, you will find out that also if the atoms can in principle backscatter the light in general, it will be enough to consider chiral coupling to learn about the transmission of light through the ensemble. Okay, we can talk about why, but take my word for it that uh, for, for if, you, if you want to know what is the output pulse the sh uh, after sending it through an ensemble of atoms, it's enough to consider that the atoms only emit into the forward direction. If they do emit into the backward direction, it could be integrated into the loss, so into the uh, emission into into free space under most circumstances. So that's what I said here, that it also describes the system dynamics for the case of symmetric coupling. And in this case, it's very simple to compute now the, trans, the, the transmission of light, so the, the amplitude transmission of light through the ensemble. 
as a function of detuning of our light pulse from the atomic uh, transition frequency because it will just be given by multiplying the amplitude transmission coefficients consecutively of all atoms one after uh, the other. And the expression for this um, transmission coefficient per atom is given by um, the interference of the incoming light and the re-radiated uh, light by the atoms. And here we have this so-called beta factor appearing. Beta is the fraction of light that is emitted into the waveguide if the atom decays. Okay, so beta is just the probability for an atom emitting its photon into the waveguide and one minus beta will then be the probability for emission into the radiation modes. And gamma naught is just the free space decay rate. And if we now want to know the temporal shape of the transmitted pulse, then we just have to decompose our input pulse into its Fourier components then propagate all the Fourier uh, components through the ensemble by multiplying the input uh, spectral amplitude at the tuning delta with the transmission amplitude transmission coefficient, and then take the inverse Fourier transform, and this will then give us the shape of um, the output pulse. So then let's look at what we see if we do this. So if we launch now light uh, through the fiber. So here I sketch the transmitted power as a function of time. Uh, the light blue shaded area is actually the bare pulse. So it's a square pulse that we launch into the fiber. The blue dots are the measured transmission and the red line is the theory prediction for the transmission uh, through the ensemble. And this was done with around 900, effectively 900 atoms coupled to the waveguide, which corresponds here to an optical depth of 19. And we, here we introduce the detuning, and this detuning uh, is like 20, 20 line widths. So it's relatively far detuned here still. Okay? And you, you see, okay, the theory prediction matches our experimental prediction very nicely. And in particular, what we see here is multi-mode Rabi oscillations, so collective Rabi oscillations. We see that the transmitted power exhibits uh, oscillations at a frequency which corresponds to the detuning of the pulse. But if you look at it, you also see that this is not just a damped sinusoidal, as you might expect from, say, Rabi oscillations of an ensemble where each atom has a slightly different Rabi frequency. But we see that here there's a kind of um, reduction of contrast, but then a small revival of, of, the, of the contrast. And uh, actually, we can understand that if we look at the uh, microscopic picture. Um, so in, this, in the sense that we now look here at uh, atom number one, atom number 100 in our uh, array and atom number 600 in the array and we look at the excited state probability of each of these atoms on a logarithmic scale here as a function of waiting time. And then you see that the first atom, atom number one, which only sees the incoming laser light will indeed perform just a damped uh, sinusoidal Rabi oscillation. So this is how a damped sinusoidal Rabi oscillation looks on a logarithmic scale. Okay. Um, but if we now look, for example, at atom number 600, then we see that it starts like the first atom, but then after this, like after almost already after performing a full Rabi cycle here, it stops and then oscillates in, like reverses the phase of the Rabi oscillation, oscillates again, here again reverses the phase of the Rabi oscillation. So here you see it oscillates and in, in phase opposition to atom number one. And the same happens also for atom number 100, okay, which uh, first oscillates in phase with atom number one, but at some point also here you see oscillates in phase opposition. So it changes the phase of the Rabi oscillation with respect to the first atom. Yeah, yes. Is it okay to ask a question? Yes, please. Item. You talk about atom number one and 600 and so on. I mean, yep. I just don't understand. The, you have a fiber. Yes. Is it in a gas? Is it's it in a, a. It's in a cloud. Oh, sorry, a laser cool. For the moment, for the moment, it is 
for the moment, it is just a laser cloud, laser cooled cloud of cesium atoms. Uh -huh. Later on, it will indeed be trapped atoms. So which it's like you talk about, they're sitting in a row, and it, it doesn't it matter how I mean, they fluctuate in and out, and they, does, does the distance to the particle so matter? Does it the, the motion, the, yes, atom distance, ab absolutely. So we do. So here we assume, indeed. For, so this is just a model prediction to understand what's going on, and. We, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. If, if the atom is further away from the fiber, it will have a lower Rabi frequency. If it's closer to the fiber, it will have a higher Rabi frequency. And uh, here, we assume a constant Rabi frequency for the atoms, so for, for all <coughs> atoms. But you can show that the prediction that you find for the ensemble, also when including the variation of Rabi frequency from atom to atom leads to the same result. So this is a simple. This is a sorry. Is my one is that a fit? So this what I what I what I said here. This 900 atoms are actually effective atoms. I I, I I used this word when I said 900, which means that you take the average coupling strength of the atoms to the guided mode, mm -hmm. and then you have an O D per atom. And what we really measure is an OD of, of 20 here, okay? And we divide it by the OD, the average o, OD per atom. Mm -hmm. So this is effective, nine, effectively 900 atoms, uh, but I, I, indeed uh, it's, just, it's just an average number, if, if you like, for the average coupling strength, okay? And the model I'm showing here to, to motivate why we see what we see is a simplified model here where I assume that all atoms have the same coupling strength, which, which will be the situation in later experiments. But this one here is indeed a 3D cloud of atoms interfaced with a 1D propagating waveguide mode. OK? okay. Thank you for the question. OK. So, but, but this is just to understand really what, what is going on here. So in this model where we assume uh, constant coupling strength, we see that actually if we, if we sketch it here, it is it's kind of the same thing as we, as we plot here. So here I sketch the probability of finding atom number 100, 200, or 300 in the excited state as a function of time. And we see these damped Rabi oscillations for the first atom, which go on and are just damped. But if you look here, here you see that the phase of the Rabi oscillations of atom number 200 switches phase uh, after a while, okay? You see these lines where the atoms switch phase. So the later the atom, the faster it switches phase of the Rabi oscillations. And there's even a second um, like phase switch of the Rabi oscillations. And the reason is that the atom number, say, 500, is not only driven by the laser, but also by the fields that are radiated by all preceding 499 atoms, which and the re-radiated light field has a pi phase shift with respect to the in incident light field. This is what leads to absorption, right? So actually what we see here uh, is an effect of the atom 500, for example, interacting both <coughs> with the incoming laser light and with the re-radiated light by all preceding atoms. And this leads to non-trivial dynamics. And in particular, this leads to super radiant decay. If you look after the switch up of the pulse, uh, at the decay rate of the different atoms, then atom number one just decays if it w as if it was on its own. Uh, atom number 100 already decays much faster, and atom number 600 much, much faster, because its emission is stimulated also by the light that comes from the preceding atoms. So this is a super radiant decay of atom number 600. Now, if we uh, want to understand better this super radiant decay here, then it's better to reduce the detuning a bit because then the energy stored in the atomic ensemble is higher and so the radiated light has a larger amplitude and we can now look at the decay rate of the pulse here after uh, the exiting our, our ensemble after switching off the drive pulse, okay? And we see that this looks kind of exponential here so we can just fit the slope at the beginning and then look at this slope and derive a decay rate as a function of, for example, here optical depth. So this was recorded for, again for an optical depth of 19, but we can vary the optical depth by varying the atom number. And what we see is that the pulse decay rate indeed increases with increasing optical depth. 
So there is super radiant decay of the ensemble into the uh, waveguide modes. However, um, there's one important aspect that I would like to highlight here. When you're dealing with super radiance and try to, then, then you would think about super radiance being a process that extracts the energy of our systems faster than, say, for the individual atoms, the decay rate of the individual atoms. But what, what we see here is just how fast the light switches off. So the question is, is that the same? So do I, when I see how fast the fluorescence from the atoms decays, does that give me a good indication of how fast the energy disappears from the ensemble? And interestingly, if you now use the model that we have and compute, because here we have a model of uh, Lagarde polynomials, and uh, this is what gives us here this switching off that after a certain waiting time, the state of the atoms is fully subradiant with respect to the um, with respect to the guided fiber mode. Um, so to explain it to you, what I'm sketching here is the excitation amplitude, which is in the case of resonant excitation, a real can, can, is a real number. So, and it can be positive and negative. And what you see is that while in the beginning I will have a state where all the atoms have positive amplitude after a while, the, from this atom onwards, due to these atoms being driven by the light emitted by the first 250 atoms here, we have a sign change of the amplitude of the following atoms. And if this area here is the same as this area here, then there is destructive interference of the emission of light. And this is what, what is predicted and happens here. And then after waiting another um, time here of, of 30 nanoseconds, then these atoms here again get this chi sign change because of the Rabi oscillation stopping and turning the other way around so that I have now like positive, negative, and again positive amplitudes and again the interference of these amplitudes will add con destructively and this corresponds again to a subradiant state. And this in principle goes on. We have seen, it's not visible here, <coughs> up to three um, like s minima of, of fluorescence emitted into the uh, mode. So maybe here is a good moment to ask for questions. Yes. Uh, in your uh, previous experiment, if you change the time between the, pulsed, the pulses, uh, I mean this explanation that you get uh, that it's a dynamic, a dynamical thing between the atoms that are uh, in the ensemble, uh, will you see a, a change in this amplitude of this uh, flash? So as long, okay, so what can happen if, I, if in this experiment I, I could change the time of the pulse, of the time between the arrival of the pulses by simply making the fiber loop shorter. Okay. Right? And interestingly, I mean, it's a, it's a question that we ask ourselves as well, what, what happens in this case? What you see will be a transition from waveguide quantum electrodynamics, where you see just a single pass of the light through the ensemble and then how the light evolves, to cavity quantum electrodynamics. As soon as the pulses start to overlap, it means that the modes of our uh, resonator uh, become so closely spaced that frequency components of the pulse excite several modes or in the time picture pulses start to overlap. And we did experiments, we are writing up the paper now, where we changed the length of the fiber loop and could see a continuous transition from the dynamics I'm presenting here to Rabi oscillations of an atomic ensemble in a cavity. Which however in the, in the transition regime have these kinks and super flashes that come from waveguide quantum electrodynamics. So actually you can, we, we, we are able now to perform experiments which really unite two fields, so to speak. Waveguide QED, where the light passes once, and cavity QED, where you have like periodic boundary conditions and the... And if you make it longer, 
like if you if you wait more nothing happens yeah you will not have these super flashes anymore oh yes the the length as as long as long as as long as this condition is fulfilled, the output will always look the same because all that happens is that my pulse propagates 20 more meters through the fiber loop. Nothing happens because of that. I mean, as long as the atomic ensemble had had the time to decay and forgot about the pulse, I can make the pulse propagate 40 meters or 400 meters. Okay, there may be some losses because of propagation in the fiber. Uh, but since this is here linear response theory, it doesn't matter if the pulse um, reduces in amplitude a bit. It's about the, 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 the shape of the pulse, <coughs> the, the temporal shape of the pulse that dictates the response of the atoms and not the, the amplitude. So if I have a bit of losses, it wouldn't change anything. So the signal will look the same for a 100 meter long fiber. It's a skept skeptical. <laughs> yeah, because maybe I didn't understand well the, the effect of this stored energy in the, inside the ensemble, but I thought it was some kind of... Uh, it has to be one long ensemble, effectively. Yeah, effectively. It's super long ensemble. Yeah. Effectively just increase the distance between some random atoms or not random, but periodically in your ensemble. Yeah. Exactly. Is it, it would be the same, I mean, if, for example, if you had one long ensemble of atoms, with an OD of 100, it doesn't matter if I change the line density of the atoms, and like if I increase the inter-atom spacing by a factor of two, I get the same result, if I keep the optical depth the same. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. okay, so I now I used up my 45 minutes that Thomas was uh, calling out. Um, but he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, 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 I will skip the fourth part of the talk for sure, but I could go on for another five minutes with the third part of the talk, okay? If, if you like. I mean, the fourth part is something that you probably know already anyways. But this is what I, what I now show is um, actually much, is, is something that has not been discussed that I've never presented because all that I showed so far was in the weak excitation regime where I have at most one atom being excited at a time in, in, the, in the ensemble. And uh, then let us now see what happens if we increase um, the number of photons, so the excitations from this uh, single weak excitation regime to almost inverted ensembles. So this uh, was done uh, again, supervised by uh, Philip and Jürgen, and uh, it was done by two PhD students, chiefly Sebastian Pucher, who's writing up his thesis now, and Chris Liedl, and there were two consecutive postdocs, Shu Wai Jin, and now there's Felix Tevin Johans, who joined the team. So here we now work no longer just with a cloud of atoms, but we indeed trap the atoms. I won't go into the details, just take my word for it, that using a two-color, a two, two detuned light fields propagating through the fiber, we can trap the atoms in a periodic array of trapping minima. And apart from thermal motion of the atom in this potential, now the coupling strength is much better defined. I mean, it is, it is, if, there, if the atoms had zero temperature, the coupling strength would be the same for all, for all atoms, okay? And now we do the same thing. However, our pulse, I mean, we do the same thing in the sense we launch a pulse into the fiber, but we now make the pulse much shorter than the atomic decay time, and we very much increase its power so that we are able to perform even up to pi optical pi pulses so that the atom becomes excited and then afterwards decays, but the excitation takes less time than the decay of the atom, okay? So this means the pulses are five nanosecond uh, long. And in this case, if we now look at the transmitted light as a function of time, what we uh, see, I mean, here I separate the time into while we launch the pulse. So here the blue, again, the blue shaded area is the uh, pulse without atoms, 
so this is our reference signal and then the red data is when we have atoms uh, coupled to the fiber and you see that when the pulse switches on then there is a transient regime where the atoms then like start to uh, 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 establish a dipole moment and thus we get uh, over time more and more absorption and then we, the pulse is switched off and we look at the fluorescence coming out of our ensemble. This is magnified by a factor of three. And we start here, but then we multiply by a factor of three for you to see it better. And if the power is very low, so this is in nanowatts here, then we have exactly the same as before. So just this uh, exponential decay of the fluorescence coming out of the ensemble at a rate which may be super radiantly increased. Okay, so this is still linear response theory, but now we're able to increase the power to the point where the prediction of linear response, which is this dashed line, starts to deviate both while the pulse is on and when we switch the pulse off and look at the fluorescence. So this is linear response theory as before, and we see that our fluorescence signal is much less. Okay, so this actually power here corresponds to about a pi half pulse. And you see this because you see that here uh, actually our absorption um, becomes lower, okay? Because I start to actually excite the atoms and have some um, sizable, like 50% probability of the atoms being uh, excited, which means that we start to saturate the atoms and the, we see an onset of a Rabi oscillation here. And if we further increase the power uh, here to 60 uh, nanowatts or so, then you see even a pi pulse. So here, the absorption of the atoms is almost gone uh, again after, after this time here. And we see that in this case, we don't even see linear response theory anymore, but we can nicely model our data. So the black line is our uh, model prediction. But this model prediction now can no longer take the atoms as just Lorentz oscillators, but we have to assume or take, consider that the atoms are two-level systems. Okay, so um, our theoretical model is now extended in the sense that uh, while between the atoms we always assume that there's a coherent field, so this is an approximation, um, the, the atoms are described by density operators of a two-level atom. I, I don't go too much into the details of the of the theory, just to say that uh, here we, uh, of course, when I couple a coherent state to a two-level system, after the two-level system, I don't have a coherent state anymore. But uh, we can pretend that it is the case by just taking the coherently radiated part coming from the atom and interfering it with the input light, okay? And um, this is what, what we do for this, and this makes life much easier because then the computation in, in conjunction with this uh, chiral coupling where the light only goes from left to right, we can solve this equation plus the equation of motion for the atoms, so the Lindblad master equation for each atom, and then we get time dependent uh, quantities alpha k here and the coherence of atom number k and the excitation probability of atom number k. And then we compute the transmitted power as being the incident power plus the, this is the um, coherent part which is radiated, but then so to speak by hand, we also put the spontaneous emission, which means that this power which we get at the end is not the same as the modulus squared of the coherent field after, I mean, according to this calculation, because spontaneous emission is taken uh, care of by putting it here, okay? And doing so, we can really nicely uh, model the dynamics of the system. In particular, if we here plot the number of absorbed photons per atom as a function of the um, pulse area, so Rabi frequency times pulse time, where we take the Rabi frequency of the first atom, then you see that we can indeed almost get 80% uh, probability of an atom being excited. Actually, this is the, the solid line and the data is absorbed number of photons, which can be inferred by the difference of areas of the red and blue um, 
pulse here. Um, from that, you can also compute really the excitation probability, which is slightly lower because there is spontaneous emission also going on. But still, you reach like 75% uh, uh, after a pi pulse. And um, then we can look at the fluorescence of the atom uh, emitted by the atomic ensemble into the waveguide. And again, what we plot is the number of emitted photons into the waveguide as a function of pulse area. And what I find interesting in this context here is that after a pi pulse where we have an inverted ensemble, the emission into the um, waveguide is much less than after a pi half pulse. It almost peaks after a pi half pulse, which shows you that the directed emission into the waveguide comes from the coherent part irradiated by the atoms, which interferes constructively and emits into the waveguide. And um, we can then also find the um, probability of an absorbed photon being emitted into the waveguide. And you see that for weak excitation, this reaches more than 60%. But it falls down to the single atom beta factor at, at a pi pulse. Okay? So the fraction of energy emitted into the waveguide is actually minimal. Uh, for the ensemble being fully inverted. Okay, so this is maybe counterintuitive or surprising, but uh, this is how it is because in that case, the spontaneous emission does not give rise to co collective emission, uh, which comes from inter constructively interfering radiating dipoles. So maybe I switch uh, to the... Uh, Conclusions in this case, because I promised that I will skip the last slide. Let's see. <clears throat> Here we are. <laughs> now my computer is unhappy again. But I hope that I can. Yes. So I hope that I could convince you that such waveguide coupled atoms are ideally suited for studying collective radiative effects from weak excitation to full inversion. Okay. We saw experimentally <coughs> coherent coupling between super and sub radiant states. So we could show that the, the light that is emitted by the ensemble on its own switches on and off in a non-periodic fashion. Um, we could see collective effects building up along the light's propagation uh, direction. <clears throat> and this is the part I, I skipped here uh, for time reasons. And so these results, I think, can be used to better understand fundamentally the interaction of uh, collective interaction of atomic ensembles with, with light, but it could also lend itself to improve quantum memories or non-realized non-classical light sources or optical frequency standards based on uh, collective uh, super radiance and sub radiance. Um, this is something you, I, I skipped. Um, I told you that we are working on exploring the transition between waveguide QED and cavity quantum electrodynamics. And what I said about the emission of a fully inverted ensemble into the waveguide being very weak is only true up to a certain threshold value of atoms. Turns out that when you have a high optical depth, at some point when you have a fully inverted ensemble, the emission of a given atom induces stimulated emission of following atoms and we expect a super radiant burst of light, so like a kind of a stimulated uh, bomb of, of photons coming out. And actually, our experiments should be able to access this regime and, and study such super radiant bursts of light. OK, so with this, I thank you for your attention. And if you want to read up uh, on the work, then this is the references.